Our gospel this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, where we read the familiar story of Jesus' temptation. After Jesus was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to Jesus, All this I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left Jesus, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Oh, let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for this morning, this day, for all your many good blessings, and uh, amen. <clears throat> Please be seated. Kids Chapel today. Ben's got it, so you know it's going to be fun. Lovely Miss Maureen and the lovely R Miss Chris. Uh, I wouldn't blame any of you if you decided to go to Kids Chapel instead of listening to the sermon, because... You're going to go, I, I can see that, makes sense to me. <laughs> well, last week, last week we said that our sermon series is MAME, the sermon series. And in it we said that God's great desire, God's great plan for the world is that love would go viral. And that the way love would go viral is that we would spread it everywhere to everyone, anytime, anywhere we can. And what we said is that today we were going to talk about a very concrete way, a very specific way that we can do that. And we are. Uh, but we're only going to have time to talk about one way. I had a bunch of ways I want to talk about, but we really only have time to talk about one. I'm going to try to exercise self-control. And that, that one way is how to deal with frustration in our life. Because if we're frustrated, as we're going to see, that works against love. If we're frustrated, we're going to send other forces out into the world uh, rather than love. Um, and we're going to look at this, this, this uh, we're going to look at frustration through the first temptation of Jesus. And that's all we're going to look at today is just that very first uh, temptation. In that first temptation, Jesus is hungry. In fact, he's starving. He hasn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. So he's in a powerful place of want. He, you know, he's, he's, got, uh, you know, he's got a strong sense of want. And I think that's something that we can all relate to. Because when it comes to appetites, we have appetites for more than food, right? We have hungers for more than food. We hunger for love. We hunger for approval. We hunger for money. We hunger for amusement. We hunger for all kinds of things. And when we don't get the things we hunger for, when our appetites go unfulfilled, then we are tempted, like Jesus was tempted today, when his hunger goes unfulfilled, we are tempted to get frustrated. And when we get frustrated, we get cross, fearful, sad. And when that happens, what we send out into the world is frustration. What, what becomes viral is frustration and the fear and anger that flow forth from that. And that's what goes viral and not love. When we don't have something we want, we tend to focus on the thing we think we need. We tend to focus on the fact that we feel like we're missing out. And when we're missing out, what we begin to do is we begin to try to force people to do what we want them to do. We try to co-op people into coordinating with our wants, doing what we want them to do. We pressurize the world so that it's in harmony with our wanting. And again, what we end up doing is instead of having love go viral, what goes viral is stress. We become stressed out and just like shock waves emanating for us, stress goes out and pretty soon everybody all around us is just plain stressed. 
And then you get a stressed out world instead of a loving world. Jesus refuses this temptation. Uh, and he refuses this temptation because for this temptation to work, Jesus have to see, has to see that he has a problem. And that problem is so severe that he has to take matters into his own hand, take matters in his own hand and act in a way that betrays the love of God, that betrays his love for himself, that betrays his love for you and I, and betrays his love for the world. So, uh, if, but, but, but Jesus, in fact, doesn't see that he has a problem. Now, to understand that, we need to remember our ABCs. Actually, we need to remember our A, B, C, D, E's, uh, and that goes like this. A, B, C, D, E. A is the adverse situation. So it's the adverse situation. B are the beliefs about that situation. C are the consequences of that belief. And then D and E are drives emotion. So these consequences drive our emotions. They drive what we're feeling. Now to better understand this, let's take a look at this in, in this first temptation of Jesus. What is the adverse situation that Jesus is facing? He's hungry, absolutely right. He's, he's starving, actually. So Jesus is hungry. What's Jesus' belief about this situation? This is a little trickier, but what's his belief about this situation? God will provide, that's exactly right. It's that God is good and that God will do right by him. So he believes God will provide. He believes that God is good, God will do right by him. And then, what are the consequences of that? What action does that lead to on Jesus' part? What, what, what's the consequence of his believing that even though he's hungry, God is good, God will do right by him? He waits on God, that's exactly right. He waits on God, and now, because he believes this and he's waiting on God, that drives his emotions, that drives how he's feeling. How's he feeling? He's perfectly content, isn't he? He's not frustrated. He's not tempted to, to behave in anger. He's, not, he's continuing to allow God to love him. He's continuing to love God. And so he's perfectly content. He's perfectly content in this situation. Now, the temptation, where does the temptation actually come? A, B, C, D, or E. Where does the temptation actually come? It actually comes right here in B. Because if the devil can change, if the tempter can change, what Jesus believes, and this runs parallel to the temptation of Adam and Eve, if the tempter can believe what Jesus believes, so that he believes that after 40 days and nights of going without food, that God's forgotten about him, that God's neglecting him, that God is not as good as other people say, that in fact God might not even be there at all, that God does not know best. See, if the devil, if the tempter can, can change Jesus' beliefs at this level, then Jesus, the consequences of that, are Jesus is going to act in a very different way. Now he's going to say, okay, I need to take matters in my own hands. I can't trust in God. Man, God, forget it. i got to do things my way. And now he acts in a way that betrays his love for God, betrays God's love for him, isn't true to his deepest values, doesn't fulfill his life's mission and purpose, and in the long run diminishes the presence of love in the world, diminishes the presence of love altogether. So the temptation comes right here. Now, I trust you see how that is relevant to our, relevant to our own lives. When we experience lack, when we experience hungers that are not fulfilled, when we experience desires that haven't been satiated, we get frustrated. When we get frustrated, we start to fantasize. And fantasizing makes our lives bearable because it introduces a pleasure that's lacking in our lives. And we fantasize about all kinds of things. We can fantasize about simply being better people ourselves. We can fantasize about having a better spouse. We can fantasize about having more money, having more time. We can fantasize about, about more, better cars, yeah, anything. Now, when we're fantasizing, we're imagining this ideal life, which is better than our life we have now, and therefore makes our own life bearable. Where on this are we? A, B, C, D, or E? We're, on, we're actually on B again, because this, is what, this isn't the actual state of our lives, right? Is it the state of our lives? Have I lost you? It's not the actual state of our lives. 
our lives might seem like we're lacking something, but the truth might be that we have more than we could ever want, right? We might think the people around us are lacking, but they might love us deeply. We just haven't given them a chance. So this isn't necessarily the actual situation. It's our belief about this situation. It's our belief that we need more or better. And when I think I need more or better rather than what I have, so that I start to fantasize these imaginary worlds, then the consequence is what? Frustration, and that frustration leads us to act how? In destructive fashion. At 8 o'clock somebody said, things get bad. And that's exactly right. Because now, this consequence of frustration, this leads us to say mean things. Frustrated with you, so I say something mean to you because I want to change you because I want you to be different than you really are. And now we want more money than what we have, so we more, make more, more hours than we really should, and we absolutely abandon the people that we said that we loved. Or we go into debt because we think we need more things than what we have, and so we go deep into debt, and that debt eats away at our relationships. And then, so those consequences, those actions, those drive our emotions. And now how do we feel? We feel frustrated, angry, fearful, anxious, bitter, resentful. And that's what begins to go viral in our lives. I don't know if, and in the world, I don't know if any of you have ever fasted. I expect many of you have. Uh, if you ever have fasted, you probably know that um, fantasizing about food sort of goes with fasting. And I was, when I was in the, uh, before I was ordained to the diaconate, I was in a monastery for a couple months. And, uh, and part of it, as, you, as you'd probably expect, part of our disciplines there were, were regular and sometimes extensive fasting. And so when I would fast, I would go back to my cell, this little sort of one uh, room, which I loved. Uh, I would go back to my, I would take cookbooks with me. I'd take cookbooks, Mike. I'd take them out and I'd just read cookbooks. And one, one of the monks, uh, his name was Nick, said, Rob, you know, that, that's, that's probably counterproductive. <laughs> and it was, because here's the thing, is while I'm fasting, I'm imagining all these foods. When the time comes to eat, is the food as good as my fantasies? No, and I'm only disappointed. And so you see, what happens is, we start and end with frustration. When we start thinking, I need, I need more better. That frustration leads me to fantasize. But what I fantasize are ideal people, ideal situations where I have more money, more this, you know, more whatever. And no situation, no person's ever going to uh, match up to that. So I end up as even more frustrated than I started. It's like Spock in a muck time. You remember that, right? If you don't, you need to Google it. That's where Spock says, you know, the very logical Mr. Spock. Who can argue with Mr. Spock? He said, you know, it may not be logical, but it is true. Very often, wanting is more pleasing than having. Because what we have, what we get, doesn't match up to what we think we want. And so these idealized lives, these, fust these fantasized lives come out of our, fran our, our uh, fantasies. They can obscure reality. They can obscure how good we have it. They can obscure how much the people around us love us. They can obscure how, you know, they can, they can obscure how good we really have it. And so what we need to do to resist this temptation to get frustrated and spread all those other things out of the world, make them go viral instead of love, is come back to here and align our beliefs more with the beliefs of Jesus. And to trust in the teachings of Jesus, to trust in the way of Jesus, to trust God. And when we do that, we trust God loves us, God will provide for us. When we do that, the Bible tells us that love always believes the best of another person. So instead of believing the worst of somebody, acting accordingly and then promoting trust, you know, and we believe the best of them. And this can change that whole equation. And what we spread then is love, not our frustration. Well, there's one more aspect of frustration I want to talk about. Uh, there are actually several more I wanted to talk about, but like I said, I'm trying to be good this morning, so I'm cutting those others out. I unfortunately went 25 minutes at 8 o'clock, so uh, I'm trying to do better at this one. How far am I now? Oh, I'm going much better. I was 17 at 8 o'clock, so there's hope. There's hope. All right, so here's the, uh, here's, the, um, here's, the, here's the second thing I want to talk about. Is that when we get frustrated, we gave up too easily on what we wanted. You see, what we, what we have to avoid, the other temptation is to give up, is to have our wants stolen for us before it becomes clear to us what we really desire. C.S. Lewis spoke about this when he says this. He says, we're half-hearted creatures. 
fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what's meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. I came across a definition of, of addiction recently, which I love, and it's just been playing over and over in my head. Uh, and I, I invite you to consider it. In fact, if you write things down, which some of you do, you should write this down. You should think about this. Uh, maybe talk about it with some people that you know. It's this. Addiction, addiction is frustration too easily satisfied. Addiction is frustration too easily satisfied. Start to think about it, you see how that, how that works. What people really want is meaningful relationships, be part of a community. What they settle for is getting drunk. And getting drunk, for the moment, takes the edge off the pain they feel of not being part of a community. We think about it in terms of what people want. They want a deep, meaningful relationship with other people where they're known and known, where, where people can honestly engage on an intimate level. But that's, that's, that's hard work. It's real hard work. It's painful work, and so what people settle for is interaction with their cell phone instead. And I'm 100% serious, because the cell phone goes off and goes off, and you know, we get text messages, we get emails, we have status updates we got to check, and, and we have links that we got to, and, so and so what we do is, instead of working hard and paying attention and loving the people in front of us, we get addicted to the good feeling our devices give to us. And, and, so, we, and, and so we'd never get the kind of relationship we look for, we're looking for, the depth of relationship that we're looking for, because we have all these shallow relationships with, uh, with a whole bunch of people, and we're distracted from ever really putting into the relationship we want to put into it. Uh, it but, but, the, but our device makes us feel so good, it takes off the edge of our longing of being as lonely as we are. That's how addiction functions. Now, now here's how I, I, I debated whether or not to share this. This is very personal, but um, I'll show you somehow this, this works for me, all right? You may know that four years ago, and Ann always has the days down, so uh, I, I took 40 days, and I went up to uh, Erie. I took my full vacation, only time in my 13 years here I've done that, but I'm going to do it again this year. Um, I, I went up to Erie for uh, 40 days, and in Erie, I basically fasted 40 days. Now, I didn't fast 40 nights, because, but I basically fasted sundown to sun up. And I wasn't doing that deliberately, but the thing is, we were, I was in Erie because I was fishing. And I was on the stream by 4 o'clock in the morning because we wanted to be on the stream before the sunrise. So I'd eat breakfast before the sun ever came up. Breakfast was top of this convenience sto store. I'd get one pumpkin spice donut. Oh, the best donuts in the world. They were so good. And I'd get an Arizona sweet lemon iced tea. And I'd have that. And then we'd hit the stream, and we would fish all day long. And I would not eat again until we came back at night when it was dark. If I ate at all, we might just go to sleep. And if we ate, all I had was a bowl of oatmeal and a vanilla Coke. But the thing is, even though we were walking miles and miles a day, you know, even though our calorie level must have been so low, I didn't feel hungry at all. I didn't feel lack at all. I didn't have any lack of energy whatsoever. All I felt was just full and overflowing because I was feasting on beauty. And I got to walk through the beauty of God's creation every day. I was feasting on the physicality of it. I love being physical, you know. I sit in an office all day because I have to, but I don't really like it. I love being outside walking in creation. I got to feast on male bonding. I had a good friend with me who likes to do what I like to do. And in, you know, this life here, I'm the, a bad example of what I tell you all to avoid, a person who's too busy to really have any, the kind of friendships that I'd really like to have. And so I got to feast on that, you know, for 40 days and 40 nights, and I felt no lack whatsoever. When I came back from Erie, I weighed 136 pounds. Last Tuesday, right before Ash Wednesday, you want to take a guess how much I weighed? <laughs> 186 pounds. 186 pounds. So that's a gain of 50 pounds. That 50 pounds represents frustration too easily satisfied. See, for 40 days you can stay in anything. But when I come back to my own life, you know, there's some frustrations in my own life. There are some things I don't do as well as I want to do them. And I work hard on those things, but I don't work as hard on them as I could. 
And so uh, when I get to the point where it really gets hard to sort of make those extra gains to be a better husband, a better priest, a better whatever it is, I eat instead. If I were to put myself on a scale of 1 to 10 on happiness, I might put myself at about 7. That's not to say that my life is bad. I actually think I have a good life. You know, I, I love this church. I love my wife. I think we have a great marriage. Uh, but, but, you know, there's things about me that could be better. Now, if I want to ever push 7 and 8, up to 8, and be a little bit happier, a little bit better, everybody benefits from that, right? But what happens at 7, what do I do? I start eating, don't I? That's where I get my pint of ice cream. And as long as I do that, because this is where it gets hard. This is where I really get frustrated. And so rather than doing the hard work of moving this up from which everybody will benefit, I eat instead. And this 50 pounds represents, in a very real way, that level of frustration and unhappiness. Maybe you do that as well. Some people eat, some people work, some people exercise, some people go to the social media. But that's, the, that's what happens. One more quick one on this. Um, uh, greed has also been defined, I love this definition of greed, as uh, despairing of ever really finding pleasure. It's despair in, in finding pleasure. It's giving up on finding pleasure. That's why, for instance, Hugh Hefner has to be greedy when it comes to sexual escapades. That's why he needs to, uh, you know, that because he's never found the one that truly satisfies. When he starts to feel pain or inadequacy or whatever he feels in that aspect of his life, he just, instead of hanging in there to build the kind of relationship that only comes with time, that's hard, that's difficult, he just moves from one to another to another, and so he never finds the one thing that he really needs. He never finds <laughs> the true love that is so much better than love at first sight, than the lust that can be so powerful, but which don't really get us where we want to go. We can do the same thing with things. The reason we have so many things is we're not satisfied with any of them. We haven't found what we really want. And Jesus is the antithesis of this. Because Jesus, he spends 40 days wanting, but he doesn't get frustrated. He lets that wanting bring focus to his life. And so at the end of that 40 days, he knows with laser focus, with crystal clarity, that it's not food that he wants. He doesn't want food. He wants to love and be loved. And so he's not going to settle for anything else. Jesus may not have had bread, but he did have love. He did have a relationship so strong that he could endure anything that came in his life. He may not have had bread, but he had a purpose that what would, have made, what, what would have made what looked like lack to other people, to him, it was, it was a chance to experience even greater fulfillment and trust in God's pleasure. Stanley Hauervoss, a one of the leading intellectuals, ethicists, and theologian in the world, says this, fasting wasn't dismal for Jesus. It was a way of life that brought joy. Because to fast is to discover the gifts that actually make our life livable. So to be drawn into a life of fasting is to learn to live without what I assumed I could not live without. To learn to live without what I assumed I could not live without is to exchange our fantasy worlds, our fantasy people, for the people right in front of us. And to love them and let them love us in a way that it's love that goes viral and not frustration. This is God's plan for you. This is God's plan for me. This is, in fact, the very hope of the world. Amen.